So tonight I have the privilege of introducing our speaker, um, Travis Novitsky. He is a lifelong resident of the North Shore of Lake Superior and was born in Grand Marais, Minnesota. He currently resides in Grand Portage. He is proud to be a citizen of the Grand Portage Anishinaabe yeah, close. nation. He has been pho photographing the North Shore for over 20 years and loves to combine photography with his other favorite activities of hiking, biking, and skiing. A self-taught photographer, his knowledge about photography has come primarily from reading books on the subject and from years of experimentation with the camera. He specializes in images of nature and wildlife, but his favorite subject is the night sky. He devotes countless hours to capturing images of moonlight, the Milky Way, and the Aurora Borealis. So please join me in welcoming Travis. This works. Oh, there we go. Okay, well, I hadn't heard that yet uh, with the mic. Do I sound okay to everybody? All right. Uh, okay, so, bonjour. Anina ji ayayan, Travis indigeni kaz, makwa indudem, gichioni gaming indunjaba. Hi, how are you? My name is Travis. I am Bear Clan. I'm from Grand Portage. Grand Portage is, a, is an Indian reservation on the shores of Lake Superior. And as I mentioned, I'm proud to be a citizen of the Grand Portage Anishinaabe Nation. So miigwech, thank you all. Jumping ahead here. Miigwech and thank you all for coming out this evening and thank you to Starry Skies North for inviting me to be here tonight to share some of my photography with you. Yeah, a lifelong resident of the North Shore of Lake Superior. I was born in Grand Marais and I've lived the majority of my life in Grand Portage at the very northeastern tip of Minnesota. I've been a photographer for most of my life, and I've been photographing the night sky now for over 20 years. I've also traveled um, pretty extensively throughout the West, Southwest, and Alaska, but I'm always drawn back to the beauty that we have here in this most unique of places, that is Minnesota. One of the reasons I love Northern Minnesota so much is because it is, of course, my ancestral homeland with my family history going back probably farther than I even realize, but also because it is an oasis of darkness. I have experienced the night sky in more places than I can count, but in my opinion, none of those places compares to the quality of the night sky that is available to us here. I've been a lover of the night sky for as long as I can remember, from nights spent with my dad while he was capturing images of the sky on film to after dark walks with my mom, to moonlight hikes, moonlight hikes and bike rides. The night sky has always been there and I've always loved it. It's a different world from that of the daylight hours. As I often like to say, nighttime is a magic time. The world looks different at night, more mysterious. Sound travels differently. The quality of light on the landscape defies description. Nights spent in the woods are some of the best memories that I have. I have heard wolves howling, loons singing, and owls hooting, all while standing under the glow of the Milky Way and under a sky filled with the dancing lights of the Aurora Borealis. These experiences stick with you and increase your appreciation for the outdoors like few other experiences can. Uh, this photograph was made during the Perseid meteor shower in August of last year. It also coincided with com Comet Neowise, which you can see over there on the left. And then you see a Perseid meteor streaking through the sky on the right side of the photo. This one was made during the Perseid meteor shower just about a month ago, or a month and a half now. Um, Sarah and I took the boat and ventured out into the middle of one of our local lakes. We dropped the anchor and started watching the sky. It only took a moment to see our first meteor. When we first got positioned on the lake, the sky was almost entirely free of clouds and the surface of the lake was smooth as glass. A sky flooded with stars above us and the smooth surface of the lake reflecting those same stars below made it feel like we were hovering in the middle of the Milky Way. After just a few minutes, however, some clouds started to move in and a light breeze kicked up. 
The breeze made the front of the boat drift back and forth. And as we drifted, my 20-second exposures turned the stars into streaks, making it look like a star trail exposure, which are typically 30 minutes or longer. It was cool to see that star trail effect in such a short exposure. We spent about an hour on the lake that night, and during that time we saw at least 20 meteors streaking through the sky. The whole experience was very surreal, and one of many that we will not soon forget. So when it comes to uh, photography, I'm pretty much self-taught. When I first got started with it, I didn't really have much of an idea what I was doing. Um, it took a lot of experimentation with the camera to get where I'm at today. And many of my first images of the night sky are what I would call failed experiments. But failing is one of the best ways to learn. If you try something and it doesn't work, then you know to try something different the next time around. I have read quite a, books, quite a few books about photography, but ultimately for me it comes down, or came down to trial and error with the camera. So this photograph here, it's one of my first, what I consider one of my first real successes at photographing the Northern Lights. The foreground subject is a cedar tree known as Manido Gigigantes, or a spirit little cedar tree. The tree overlooks Lake Superior up on the Grand Portage Reservation. I live about one mile away from it and photograph it often. And when I started getting into aurora photography, the spirit tree was one of the first subjects that I wanted to capture with the aurora. Contrary to what a lot of people believe when they first see this photo, the orange that we see on the horizon is not the approaching sunrise, but rather the glow of city lights from Thunder Bay, Ontario which is about 40 miles away. So this one, this is one of my earliest successes at photographing the Milky Way. And I call this one Starman. Um, does anybody here remember the 1980s movie starring Jeff Bridges? It's one of my favorites. Um, I had been playing around with my flashlights for several exposures when I came up with the concept for this shot. So I had my back to the camera and realized that if I tipped the lights slightly backwards towards the camera, it would make these sort of glowing orb shapes in my hands. And so this was a 30 second exposure where I held my hands downwards, kind of about here, for a few seconds and then slowly raised them up a little bit and then held them steady for the remainder of the shot, which then made these short streaks as my arms moved up. My imagination kind of runs wild with it. Um, if you remember the movie, um, Starman had these kind of metal balls that would allow him to create like, or perform little miracles, I guess you'd say. And so I, I envision him just kind of holding one in each hand, creating the stars with his mind, holding his arms out, and then just flinging them up into the sky. And then uh, for the next few images, I'd like to talk just a little bit about light pollution. Um, some of you probably already know, or maybe everybody does here, that northern Minnesota is one of the best areas in the continental U.S. for pristine views of the night sky. Part of northern Minnesota is a level one dark sky area, according to light pollution measurements. And this is the best rating possible for night sky viewing, according to the Bortle scale, which is a nine level scale measuring the brightness of the night sky. We are very fortunate to have the quality of night sky that we do. Roughly 80% of the world's population is unable to see the Milky Way due to light pollution. So uh, this is Pancake Island on Lake Superior up in Grand Portage. And in this photo, you can see how much impact just one yard light can have. The illumination on the left side of the island is coming from one single residential porch light about a quarter mile away. You can also see light on the horizon coming from one of the communities on the south shore of Lake Superior. And I'd also like to point out the angle of the Milky Way in this shot, which was taken in April. As we move through the seasons, our view of the sky is always changing. And the next photo shows what the Milky Way looks like in August. It shows the view from the point of land we see on the left side of this shot 
looking towards Pancake Island. And here, so here you can see a different way that that same porch light has an effect on the scene. Normally the rocks in the foreground would be dark black shadows, but here they're illuminated by that yard light so much that we can see the different colors in the lichen blanketing the rocks. And that's also me in the picture. And you can see that the lights light me up pretty good as well, almost as much as daylight would. And then uh, notice the orientation of the Milky Way compared to the last photo. It's much more vertical as we get towards the end of summer, whereas in the spring, it's at a very low angle on the horizon. So again, this is Pancake Island on the left, and in the distance is Blueberry Island. These are labeled as such on nautical charts and maps, but I've also got my own name for them. I refer to them as the Breakfast Islands, because of course, blueberries and pancakes go really well together for breakfast. Uh, this one shows Lake Superior at Temperance River State Park. Um, nature likes to remind us how small we are. When you sit on the shoreline of the largest freshwater lake in the world, staring out at the Milky Way floating above the horizon, you can't help but be reminded of that. The vastness of space is a magnificent thing to try and comprehend. This photo kind of shocked me when I made it. Not just because of how amazing the Milky Way looked and how unusually calm Lake Superior was, but also how much light pollution there was. As I was sitting there that night with my naked eye, I could see just a little bit of light on the horizon from communities on the South Shore. But when I made my first photograph of the scene, I was amazed at how much light that this 30 second exposure picked up. The entire horizon kind of looked like one big city. So what we're looking at here are, I believe, the communities of Ashland, Bayfield, and Washburn in Wisconsin on the right side, and over towards the left, um, probably Ironwood and Ontonagon in Michigan. And remember, as we all know, Lake Superior is a very big lake. Those communities range from probably 60 to 70 miles away. This is another one from Temperance River. It's the photo that I had in my mind that I wanted to capture that night when I went there in mid-March 2018. However, when I got there, I was a bit early and the Milky Way hadn't risen above the trees yet. So I went down to the shoreline, made some photos down there first, including the one we just saw. And after shooting along the shoreline for about an hour or so, I came back to the spot and the Milky Way was right where I'd hoped it would be. This was taken at 4.29 a.m. on March 17th. And I really like how the tree line here complements the arc of the Milky Way. Here's one that I took on the Lake Superior shoreline near Five Mile Rock, just north of Grand Marais. It was a nice cold night, about five degrees below zero. And again, we can see light on the horizon from some communities along the South Shore. What's also interesting here is the illumination on the ice. The way that Highway 61 curves through this area, as well as its proximity to the lake, means that about a mile away as cars are traveling up the highway, their headlights hit this ice formation. Their lights hit the ice for a total of maybe 15 to 20 seconds. And remember, they're, they're about a mile away. And the illumination shown here is from just one single car going by. So quite a bit of impact, even from a very temporary light source. I often try to think of um, catchy or creative titles for my images. And I can't remember where. This might be a famous quote from a painter from several hundred years ago. but. Um, I titled this one, The Sight of the Stars Makes Me Dream. And here's what I wrote about it in my blog on March 11th, 2018. Last night was an unforgettable one. I spent a couple of hours hanging out on the Lake Superior shoreline just north of Grand Marais. It was a clear, cold night, which meant the view of the stars was incredible. And just before 4 a.m., or that night, 3 a.m., if you hadn't set your clocks ahead yet, the thin crescent moon rose above the horizon. 
The subdued moonlight behind the island made for a surreal glow with the Milky Way stretching, stretching across the sky above. There was absolutely no wind and the air was extremely quiet. A thin layer of ice had formed on the surface of the lake and I could hear its crunching noises as the lake currents moved it around further out from shore. Nights like this one are some of my favorite times to be outside. And so, you know, the summer sky, the summer night sky tends to get most of the attention because that's when we have this big glorious view of the ribbon of the Milky Way. But the winter night sky is equally impressive. You might not have that view of the ribbon, but the cold nights make the stars seem larger and more vivid, even closer somehow. And some nights it seems that they're so close you could reach them and just reach up and just pluck them out of the sky. So this photo was taken in January during the new moon phase when the nights are, are about as dark as they get. But as you can see here, the nights are never truly completely dark. During new moon, the starlight is so bright that it illuminates snow-covered trees and ground well enough to see with the naked eye. Has anybody experienced that? Being out there during new moon and just not needing a headlight, headlamp or anything? Very cool. Um, here's another one taken during the new moon, this time in October. These are maple tree tops in the sugar bush area of Grand Portage. The constellation Perseus and the Andromeda galaxy can be seen above the tallest tree on the left. Now you might have noticed that there can be quite a variety in the colors of the sky at night. Depending on the time of year, the moon phase, and any nearby sources of light pollution, I'm sure there are scientific explanations for this, but I have no idea what they are. What I do know is that I typically shoot or edit my photos with a color temperature of around 3,500 to 4,000 K, and oftentimes the colors that I get vary quite a lot. On clear, cold nights, you can see more stars than you ever thought possible. And one of the things I like the most about winter is that there aren't any leaves on the trees. So we can see the beautiful shapes and silhouettes that are hidden by the leaf cover in the summer. I made this photo while out snowshoeing at night. Snowshoeing after dark is one of my favorite things to do. But sometimes I don't make it very far because I'm always stopping so much and looking up at the trees. Always on the lookout for the next, for another nice photo composition. So this one is um, Star Trails and Northern Lights. I took this one in, on March 31st, 2017, and I had gone out that night looking for the Northern Lights. The forecast numbers for the Aurora were looking pretty good, but by the time I got on location, the lights were really faint. They were there, but they were really hard to see, almost, almost couldn't see them. So I decided to try a star trail exposure while waiting to see if the lights would pick up. I let the camera record for 72 minutes, and during that time, the glow of the northern lights didn't really seem to change. It was an almost imperceptible glow that showed up really nicely on this one hour and 12 minute exposure. This is a good visual example that illustrates how, from our perspective at least, the North Star is the only sky in the star that doesn't move and all of the other stars rotate around it. And of course, it, it does move just a little bit, but you can't tell in, in the photo. <clears throat> this is the famous uh, hollow rock on Lake Superior up in Grand Portage. Hollow rock is easily one of my favorite subjects. This was taken in early April and it's my standard exposure time of, for the Milky Way of 30 seconds. And unlike what we see in this shot, long exposure star trail photos represent something that we are unable to see with our naked eye. The passage of time recorded onto a single image and the lines made by the starlight when that light is recorded over a period of time. The next photo shows the same composition 
but with an exposure time of 38 minutes. So as in the previous photo, from the top left down to the lower right, you can see a milky band of light, which is the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Like all the more distinct trails that you see from more prominent stars, the galactic center of the Milky Way moves across our sky, and that light kind of gets spread out when recorded for a long period of time. So, you know, if you went out there and watched, the Milky Way earlier in the evening might be down here. A few hours later, it's going to be up here. So as it's moving, the camera records that light, and it makes kind of that, you still see the Milky Way, but it's, it's spread out. And in this shot, we're looking south-southeast. So unlike the view to the north, where we get circular patterns in the stars, the stars to the, to the south show us a curvature, but not full circles. So another type of image that's a lot of fun to make. Um, for this one, I lined up the Milky Way right in the center of my camera frame. And like most of my Milky Way shots, it was again 30 seconds long. However, for this one, for the first 15 seconds, I left my camera lens at 14 millimeter. And then for the next 15 seconds, I zoomed it in, turned the lens barrel just as slowly and smoothly as I could, trying not to jerk it, ending the exposure at 24 millimeters. So I kind of went maybe from here to here. Um, and then it ended up with these streaks, which are really, really kind of cool. Um, the visual here, first thing I thought of was Star Wars when Han Solo says, punch it, Chewie, and they go to light speed in the Millennium Falcon. Uh, so this one is uh, spring. Um, a lot of people think that that's like mud in the foreground or maybe rock, but it's actually ice. Kind of the last of the ice on Chester Lake um, up in Grand Portage State Forest, and this was on May 7th, 2018. And uh, I had kind of this super interesting and slightly scary encounter while photographing this scene. I was standing at the end of the short dock on Chester Lake under the Milky Way. And as you can see, it, it was an incredibly calm night. So calm that the stars were re reflecting almost perfectly in the water. And the calm and quiet meant that I could hear every little noise in the forest. When I arrived at the lake, there were a couple of rabbits that were running around in the brush near the shoreline. I saw them in my car headlights when I first pulled up. And as I sat there kind of absorbing the scene and planning out how I wanted to shoot it, I could hear them chasing each other back and forth in the woods. After a while, they either got tired or they left the area as I couldn't, couldn't hear them anymore. By then I was making my first shots and getting my exposure, my composition dialed in. And by the time I had everything just right, I could once again hear rustling in the woods behind me. Only this time it sounded different. This time it sounded like a much larger animal. I turned and faced the shoreline, but it was way too dark to see anything. The noises kept coming closer. Then I heard a couple of twigs snap, and then, I kid you not, I could hear the exhale of its breath. Just kind of a big huff. So I reached up to my headlamp and I kind of held the button down, which turns it onto this uh, soft red light. And there, standing about 30 feet away, was a cow moose right on the edge of the lake. And all of a sudden, I got, you know, a little nervous. My heart rate started elevating. But I stood still, tried not to make a sound, turned off my headlamp, and the moose turned and started to walk through the brush along the water's edge. It walked right past the end of the dock and through the brush for maybe another 50 feet along the shoreline, then turned and headed back inland. And once I could hear that it was quite a ways away, I let out a sigh of relief, turned around and started taking more pictures. <laughs> I never saw or heard it again that night. So uh, my nerves might have been a little on edge after that moose encounter, but I decided to hang out there on the end of that dock for quite a while longer until eventually the moon started to rise. 
and I couldn't believe the beauty as I sat there watching the sky trade starlight for moonlight. A little while later when I left the lake, I could see moose tracks on the gravel road as I drove away. Standing under the glow of the Milky Way in such a beautiful location is special enough, but having a wildlife encounter like that makes it even more memorable. And in the summer of 2018, we had, I guess, what I referred to then and still do, um, this amazing conjunction of celestial bodies. So on the, on the left here, the bright light that kind of looks like the moon, that's Mars. And then, on, and then Jupiter is way over on the right side, kind of right above the, the point down the shoreline. And this conjunction lasted for a good part of the summer. The island we see here again is Hollow Rock, only this time looking southwest towards it instead of southeast. The glow on the clouds is coming from city lights from Grand Marais, which is about 35 miles down the shore. On July 10th, as I stood on the Lake Superior shoreline in awe of this sky, I felt like, again, kind of like I was in a real, real life science fiction movie. It evoked more imagery reminiscent of Star Wars, like the scene where Luke Skywalker is standing out in the desert on Tatooine, watching multiple suns setting. This is what the night sky looked like the evening before a big geomagnetic storm hit. This was the night of the summer solstice, and the aurora borealis was supposed to hit our atmosphere big time but it ended up being delayed until the following night. Since the aurora forecast was so good, I headed out and spent the entire night waiting for the lights. And they did show up a little bit between two and three in the morning, but nothing at all like what I ended up witnessing the following night. The views of the Milky Way, however, were some of the best I've seen. <clears throat> and this was taken in a logging cut. So an area that had been logged where they left some some old pines as kind of seed trees and logging cuts are some of my favorite places to go for night sky photography. In general, our forest up in the northeast part of the state is so thick that it can be challenging to find good views of the sky. So areas that have been logged make for nice open views when combined with these seed trees that were left. You get these awesome views like this. So in the, in the past few years, um, I've learned a lot about anchors. And I'm not talking, you know, a heavy anchor that keeps you weighted down like a ship's anchor, but rather those things in our lives that keep us grounded and centered. Things that we need in order to stay true to ourselves. And so in that vein, I have a little quote that I'd like to share with you. We've all experienced that cloud that can consume us. Times in life when things can be hazy and unclear, emotionally, mentally, and physically. That's when we call on our anchors, the things that we trust. Do your best to find and identify those anchors in your life. They'll help you push through those clouds to greater clarity, harmony, and positive results. Life's clouds and haze will always come and go. Find your anchors to help you push through. So these words of wisdom came, in my mind anyway, from a, from a pretty unlikely source, um, from an Instagram post by Dwayne Johnson, perhaps better known as The Rock. And I find them to be very relatable to this image and to a lot of my images. Water connects the earth and the sky. And in addition to photography, the night sky and water are some of my most important anchors. They help bring balance to my life. When I sit on the shoreline of a calm lake at night, staring out at a sky full of stars reflected like we see here, that's when I feel the most centered and at peace. So now I'd like to get into some Northern Lights stories. On October 2nd, 2013,
there were awesome lights that came as quite a bit of a surprise. Spaceweather.com, which is kind of my, my main source for tracking aurora forecasts, said that arriving a little earlier than expected, a CME or coronal mass ejection hit Earth's magnetic field at approximately 0200 universal time. And the impact sparked a G2 class geomagnetic storm with auroras across Canada and several northern tier states. I had just finished watching a movie and I was laying in bed looking at Facebook on my phone when I noticed there were some posts about the lights being out. So I looked at some forecast sites and sure enough, they were indicating the aurora was at storm level. So just seconds before, I had been super tired. But when I see stuff like that, all of a sudden I'm energized and I'm wide awake. And this night I walked out onto the deck in my backyard and I saw this large glowing arc of aurora over Mount Josephine. So of course what happened next should be obvious. I grabbed my gear, hopped in my truck, and headed inland to photograph the lights and spent the next four hours watching probably the best aurora storm to occur that year. In 2010, Lake Vermilion State Park was established with five miles of beautiful shoreline along the south shore of Lake Vermilion in Northeast Minnesota. This state park sure makes a great location for watching the night sky. There's hardly any light pollution at all, and with the park being on the south shore of the lake, it's a prime location for looking north and watching the aurora. So here's another one from Lake Vermilion. This one was taken over Armstrong Bay, which is perfectly situated for an awesome view of that northern night sky. And as I like to say, this was, I call this the night of the loons. I've heard loons pretty frequently when I've been out shooting at night or just sitting there, even if I'm not shooting. And, um, but on this night, there were so many of them. It sounded like there were at least five or six, maybe more, because they, they kept, their calls kept coming from different parts of the lake and it seemed like they were talking to each other. It was really cool to be sitting there hearing that while looking at what we see here. What was I talking about the other night? Uh, Memory burn, gives you good memory burn. <laughs> um, October 7th, 2015, this storm started off pretty quietly with a soft glow just above the tree line. By about 2 a.m., the activity was picking up considerably and there was a ribbon of light undulating across the northern sky. One of the first photographs I made of the lights that night, this, the area shown here, is one of my favorite locations for viewing the night sky. Kind of has that classic Minnesota Northwoods feel to it. Then between three o'clock and five in the morning, the sky exploded and the aurora was dancing like crazy. I stopped at several different locations and made a lot of nice images, but my favorite was this inland lake that provided a nice wide open view. It didn't hurt that it was such a calm night. The calm air and the still water was perfect for enjoying the light show. Then at around 4.45, the lights were at their most intense. In addition to the ribbon of green waving horizontally above the horizon, pillars of light in hues of white, green, and purple shot up vertically and then wiggled their way across the sky. And about 5.20 now, and things were starting to quiet down. The dancing pillars were fading, and the horizontal ribbon was lowering itself closer to the horizon, and its movement was slowing. But the glow persisted as night transitioned to day. To me, that night, as a collective, felt like one giant breath of the solar wind. Ending much like it started, the first part of the night felt like this drawing of a deep and powerful inhale. And then the peak of activity with the pillars and brisk movement of light was like that initial surge of an exhale. And then the quiet that approached dawn, like the final bit of breath leaving the lungs, preparing for the next inhale. So July 10th, 2015. 
Many times when the lights are out, we don't see these awesome ribbons or pillars that everyone imagines when they think of Aurora photos. Instead, what we see is this soft glow on the horizon that to the untrained eye can easily be mistaken for the glow of city lights. But if you take a picture of it, you'll see that it is in fact the glow of the Aurora, which will most often show up in pictures as a bright green color. To our naked eye though, it usually appears as kind of an off-white or gray. So th this is one of my favorite locations anywhere, I think. And normally I like it not only because of the perfect lake view and an angle on the northern sky, but also because most of the time it's a really quiet spot. On the night of July 11th, 2015 though, it was a very different story. It was memorable not only because it had one of the best Aurora shows that I've ever seen, but also because of what I heard as I sat on the shoreline watching these lights dancing overhead. When I arrived at this remote lake, I immediately could hear voices off in the distance. There are a couple of state forest campsites on this lake, and one of them was occupied by what sounded like three young men in their early 20s. And thanks to the stillness of that night and the acoustics of the bay, I could hear everything they were saying, even though they were a couple of hundred feet down the shore. At first I was annoyed by how loud they were, but once I started paying a little closer attention, I started to get pretty entertained by their conversation, which the most memorable went something like this. Dude, how old do you think that tree is, that one that looks like it's about 15 feet tall? I don't know, man. Maybe 20, 25 years old? You know, that tree's probably the same age as us. I wonder if it's as smart as we are. <laughs> you know, that tree is probably just as important to the universe as we are, maybe more. Man, can you imagine what all that solar energy must be doing to our atmosphere? I mean, it's got to be doing something. That's a lot of energy just slamming into us. It's got to have some sort of effect. So that was, those, those were kind of the best, best ones. There was a lot more, but as they were talking constantly as the night went on, um, and eventually they launched their canoe and they paddled out around the point. And they were out on the lake for maybe an hour and then paddled back in. And I don't think they ever had any idea that I was there. This one was taken in February on a night with an almost full moon, which illustrates just how strong the aurora can sometimes be because those lights, they've got to be really strong in order to see them this well on such a brightly moonlit night. And you also might notice that the majority of my photos show auroras taken in spring, summer, and fall, which addresses kind of this common misconception that the lights can only be seen in winter. I hear that a lot, like people think they, they just don't come out in the summer. And of course, if you're farther north than we are, you won't see them because the sun never sets, but um, we see them, of course, pretty frequently here in the summer during solar maximum times. So our likelihood of seeing them in winter, you know, might be higher simply by virtue of the nights being longer, but they're just as likely to occur at other times of the year as they are in the winter on average, solar minimum notwithstanding. <laughs> so a uh, case in point, this event from May 13th, 2015, this is the view over um, Grand Portage Bay looking towards Mount Josephine and Hat Point. And uh, this, is, this is my neighborhood. I live in between those clusters of lights over near the right edge of this scene. You can't actually see my place though because I don't leave any outside lights on at night. This was one of those nights where the lights were super active, moving really quickly and constantly throughout the sky. And 2015, that was an awesome year for Northern Lights. 
They occurred frequently and were, were really strong, sometimes filling two-thirds or more of the sky. <clears throat> the night shown here, which was uh, June 23rd, was probably the best of the best of the aurora shows that I've ever seen. I had planned on heading inland that night to photograph the show over an inland lake, but I never made it up there. As I was driving down Highway 61, I looked out the left, left side window and I saw the lights erupting over Lake Superior, which of course, you know, to the south. And this photo, it kind of blew my mind when I first looked at it on the camera because it was the first time where I captured such powerful aurora and the Milky Way together in the same shot. And after making this image, I adjusted my camera on my tripod and shot straight up into the sky. And this is what I saw. This one I titled Imaginarium. The lights were flickering and pulsating so quickly that I shot several hundred images in a rather short period of time and every one of them looked utterly and completely unique. After reviewing most of them, I chose this one as my favorite. And I call it Imaginarium because it definitely sparks the imagination. And a few of the things that I saw when I first looked at it were, I guess the first thing I saw was a cranky cat. And then I saw a bird and the Grinch. <laughs> you might see something completely different. So then when I angled my camera um, back down at Hollow Rock, in addition to the greens, there was now a lot of red and purple visible as well. And this rainbow of colors lasted maybe 15 to 20 minutes and then shifted mostly back to green. Mother's Day Aurora. The uh, early morning hours of May 8, 2016 produced a beautiful northern light display. And what a perfect way to celebrate Mother's Day with Mother Nature herself putting on such an extraordinary show. The lights shown here occurred around 3 a.m. once the clouds started to part. And the night up to this point had been mostly cloudy. And the parting clouds, I think, added a lot to the photo, giving it an extra layer of depth and interest. The uh, Mother's Day storm gave us this incredibly bold ribbon of green that was waving throughout the sky, much more common in places like Alaska or Norway. It's a special treat to see auroras like this in northern Minnesota. This was looking east over Waswagening Bay and the Susie Islands up in Grand Portage. The break in the clouds lined up perfectly with that ribbon of light. So as that night came to an end and daylight ushered in, this ribbon slowed its movement and transi transitioned to an arc that stretched from west to east across the sky. It was a nice ending to yet another unforgettable night. I feel like I say that a lot, but it's really true. Pretty much every one of them is unforgettable. So if you follow my photography online, um, you know that I love to travel on road trips, especially to the west and southwest. I love the desert almost as much as I love the north, north woods. And in that vein, I'd like to share a few images from some of my travels. A couple of years ago, I was in southern Utah for a few weeks. And one of the highlights of that trip was spending a few days in the backcountry of Capitol Reef National Park. What I was most looking forward to while I was in Capitol Reef was experiencing the night sky in Cathedral Valley. Throughout the majority of my trip, I was seeing crystal clear nights and mornings with afternoons dominated by violent thunderstorms. The night I was in Cathedral Valley, the forecast was calling for rain, which is not good for someone hoping to experience the night sky. As day turned to night, the clouds got thicker and thicker. Lightning flashed in the distance to the south, and the wind was howling. I crawled into my sleeping bag in the back of my Jeep and set my alarm for 2 a.m. When I woke up and looked outside, I couldn't see a single star. 
But despite this, I gathered my gear and walked over to the large sandstone formation known as the Temple of the Moon. The wind had died out and it was very quiet. As I approached the temple, it looked like a small opening was forming in the clouds. So I set up my tripod looking to the north. Within a few minutes, the clouds opened up some more and revealed some stars. But still, the opening in the sky was very small and I knew that in order to see the Milky Way, it'd have to open up a lot more. But I'm always pretty optimistic so in anticipation of that, I moved to the north side of the temple and set up my tripod looking to the south. The clouds were still really thick in that direction, so for a long while I just stood there and hoped for the best, watching as every now and then a few stars would appear just for a moment and then quickly disappear again behind the clouds. After an hour and a half of looking up, I started to lose hope. Soon, daylight would be arriving. And I was about to call it a night when the clouds pushed out just enough to get a glimpse of the Milky Way. And just like that, there it was. The cloud cover pushed quickly to the south, revealing the Milky Way in all its glory. Once it was revealed, the cloud movement kind of stalled and it just hung there, the galaxy lining up perfectly with the edge of this cloud bank. The crescent moon was rising as well behind the clouds, giving them some nice illumination from behind. <clears throat> so I had been totally ready to call it a night, kind of chalking it up to a good experience outdoors, even if I didn't get the photos I'd hoped for. And what I ended up with was a photo that exceeded all my expectations and another memory of an experience that I'll never forget. The next day as I was driving the rest of that rugged road out of Cathedral Valley, I was listening to the TED Radio Hour where author Boyd Vardy was talking about his book called The Cathedral of the Wild. And this wasn't something I had recorded, it just came on on the radio. Um, very, very well timed. But uh, during that program, he said these words which really struck with me, stuck with me. In the Cathedral of the Wild, we get to see the most beautiful parts of ourselves reflected back at us. How fitting I thought that I would hear this on the radio the day after having my experience in Cathedral Valley. So a different trip, my trip to the Southwest in November of 2018 started with uh, a three-night visit to the small town of Borrego Springs in Anza Borrego Desert State Park. The main reason I wanted to visit this area at night are the over 100 metal sculptures by artist Ricardo Braseda. Many of these sculptures are dinosaurs, and I thought they would make for some really cool images when photographed at night, such as this one, which I call the Battle for Borrego Springs. Borrego Springs has a population of about 3,000, but millions more live within a two to three hour drive. Receiving a dark sky community designation in 2009 from the International Dark Sky Association, it is California's first community with that designation. So to be a dark sky community, a town has to show exceptional dedication to the preservation of the night sky through the implementation and enforcement of a quality outdoor lighting ordinance, dark sky education, and citizen support of dark skies. On Zabrego Desert State Park, which completely surrounds the town and at 633,000 acres, is California's largest state park, received its dark sky park designation in 2018. The only other dark sky parks in California are nearby Joshua Tree and Death Valley National Parks. And these collective designations make that area one of the largest dark sky areas anywhere, much like the designations recently received by the Boundary Waters, Voyagers National Park, and Quetico Provincial Park. <clears throat> The dark sky designations have been pretty good for the area's economy. Astronomy and astro 
photography lovers travel from all over the world to appreciate the area's night sky quality. And of course, perhaps more importantly than tourism, dark skies are important for health. Evidence now links light pollution with negative impacts on the human immune system, behavioral changes in animals, and decreased plant growth. In addition to quality habitat for plants and animals, dark sky parks serve as a refuge for humans as well, offering beautiful vistas, quiet solitude, and stunning night skies filled with stars. Light pollution maps reveal that the area from Death Valley down to Anza Borrego, much like the area we have here in northern Minnesota, is truly an oasis of darkness. I've noticed that more and more people are coming north to experience this oasis. In the past couple of years, I've seen more people than ever before coming to the North Shore, Superior National Forest, and Boundary Waters Canoe Area to appreciate the high quality dark skies. This last one from my time in Brago Springs is, is my favorite, and I call it Taming the Dragon. Uh, the past couple of years have been pretty tough on everybody. This co the COVID pandemic turned into something that none of us could have ever expected. And it has taken its toll on everyone in different ways. We have all had to tame that dragon, so to speak, in ways that make sense to us. Photography and the experiences that I have in the pursuit and creation of my images are very healing, and the night sky plays a large part in that. They have proven themselves in that regard time and time again throughout my life. And one of the things I've noticed over my many trips to the Southwest is, is how quiet the desert nights can be. Growing up here in the land of water in northern Minnesota, completely silent nights are hard to come by. Water is always moving, and with that movement, there is sound, of course. And in stark contrast to that, I have experienced several nights in the desert where the silence is deafening, and I can't get enough of it. Um, one more photo from travels. This one is from the White Mountains in California, just north of Death Valley. Experiencing the stars at over 10,000 feet in elevation brings a whole new level of appreciation to the night sky. At elevations such as this, you're looking through much less atmosphere and the amount of clarity in the sky is unreal. The White Mountains are home to bristlecone pines, some of the oldest living organisms on Earth. The oldest one has been on this planet for more than 5,000 years and they only grow at high elevations between 5,000 and 11,000 feet. I spent just one night here, but I can't wait to go back. Felt at home amongst these ancient trees. And coming back to Minnesota now, you might have noticed that the past couple of years have been pretty quiet in terms of aurora activity. This following article called a Summer Without Sunspots was written by Dr. Tony Phillips and published September 26, 2019 on spaceweather.com. From June 21st until September 22nd, the sun was blank more than 98% of the time. During the entire season, only six tiny sunspots briefly appeared. Not a single significant solar flare was detected during this period of extreme quiet. This is a sign that solar minimum is underway and probably near its deepest point. For 2019 overall, the sun had been blank 72% of the time, which made that solar minimum, that current solar minimum, to be century class, meaning you have to go back to the beginning of the 20th century to find lulls in solar activity this deep. Contrary to the sound of it, however, solar minimum is not boring. Streams of solar wind are still able to punch through the sun's magnetic field, causing geomagnetic storms, such as this one here, photographed on August 30th, 2019. And this one on April 16th, 2021. 
So that, that summer of 2019 also brought a sign that solar minimum is coming to an end. A sunspot that briefly appeared on July 7th had a reversed magnetic polarity. And according to Hale's law, sunspots switch polarities from one solar cycle to the next. The reversed polarity of that July 7th sunspot marked it as a member of the next solar cycle, solar cycle 25. Cycles always mix together at their boundaries. And as we move further into solar cycle 25, we can expect to see more frequent aurora events. And if forecasters are correct, the next solar maximum should be in full swing by 2023. <clears throat> so I got just a few more here. Um, back in August, I was out photographing the Milky Way and I did see a little bit of aurora glow as well. It was barely visible to the naked eye, but showed up more prominently in this long exposure photo, which is one of only a handful of images that I made that night. And I'll elaborate on that more in just a moment. Um, the most notable quality of that night, however, was the silence. It was very much like the utterly silent nights that I've experienced in the desert. To hear that silence, you need to push everything out of your mind and let yourself truly be in that moment. And that's not an easy thing to do. Our minds tend to always be running with some sort of thought or memory. Our subconscious is always replaying that day's events or thinking about what might happen tomorrow. Most of the time, I don't think we even realize that we're doing that. And that's why I like the night sky so much. Basking in the glow of the night sky is the easiest way that I can quiet my mind and just be there in the present. When I'm gazing up at the sky, especially on such a quiet night, I feel completely relaxed and refreshed. It's one of the best ways, in my opinion, to balance out the clutter and commotion of modern life. So for the past couple of years, I've kind of been practicing this mindfulness and being in the moment as much as I can, and it's had a pretty profound effect. I used to kind of busy myself with capturing as many images as possible and thinking about when or how I was gonna share them with the world. But lately, over the past maybe two years or so, um, I've been thinking, or I've been doing less of that and instead trying to fully immerse myself in each moment and experience. And much of the time when doing this, I never even take my camera out of the bag. Sometimes when I do make images, I don't share them for maybe a month or more. Instead, I wait until it feels right to share them, if in fact I share them at all. And a while after I was already into this shift in my method, I watched another TED Talk, this time with actor Joseph Gordon-Levitt. And his talk was about getting attention versus paying attention. And the takeaway quote that resonated with me was, if your creativity is driven by a desire to get attention, you're never going to be creatively fulfilled. And I realized, at least on some level, that that's how I had come to feel. I wasn't really feeling creatively fulfilled anymore because the reasons I was doing photography had become more about satisfying others than about personal fulfillment. So I've been striving to get back to that method of being more mindful with my photography. And in that practice of being mindful, I've noticed that I feel much calmer than I used to. My mind doesn't race the way that it used to. I feel rested and peaceful more often than not. And my actions with the camera are much more deliberate and thought out than they used to be. And I feel like these last few photos are good representations of that mindfulness. Each one is one of less than five images that I made on each night. And I feel like they really convey the sense of calm and peacefulness that comes with truly being in a moment right then and there. And they also remind me <clears throat> of a favorite saying and title of a book about mindfulness. 
Wherever you go, there you are. Miigwech and thank you. Whoa, that's great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we do have this short uh, two-minute video to share with you that, um, where's Bob? That Bob edited, I think, shot all of the clips. Oh, no, these are my, my clips, right? You, you shot the video of me. Bob and John Shepard from Hamlin interviewed me, and they, they edited together this, this really cool video. So it's pretty short, but that's what we're going to kind of, kind of our finale. To me, water, water connects the earth and the sky. And a lot of times that's most evident when you're at an inland lake and you see the stars of the Milky Way reflecting in the surface of a nice calm lake. And you're gazing up at the Milky Way, which is just larger than life, it seems. And there's absolutely no wind on those nights. You can see the stars reflecting in the lake, almost a perfect reflection of the sky. No matter what's going on, no matter what kind of difficulty I might be having, I can come to a place like this and just lose myself in it and be kind of get lost in the mindfulness of that experience. There's that connection, right? Like you've got the water, which makes its cycle through evaporation, goes up into the atmosphere and comes back down as rain. It's all connected, just like everything in life is connected. And being there in those moments and seeing something that's so far away, and by that I mean the Milky Way, tied to something that's right there in front of you, that water, the surface of that lake, it makes you feel insignificant and kind of large all at the same time and part of all of that part of that energy that ties everything together so thank you guys for that video i think that turned out great And I'm always willing to hang around if anybody has questions, technical or otherwise, about the photos, or I'll try to answer if I can. <laughs> yeah, if, if anyone uh, does have questions, come and grab the microphone so people on Zoom can hear you as well. Um, otherwise, I'd also like to remind you that we do have the stargazing downstairs afterwards, so feel free to go down there and check that out too. So. And it's cool if nobody has any questions. <laughs> yeah. This is a, a good spot to end. Let's uh, go enjoy the stars. Thanks so much, Travis. Thanks, everybody. Thank